So what I'll be talking about is the effect of multiple interacting global change factors. Primarily, I'll be talking about elevated CO2, nitrogen pollution, and invasive species, and looking how are these going to affect wetland plant communities. Um, before I go any further, first thing I want to do is thank my collaborators and students. Um, so Pat McGonigal has been working with me on this project, as well as Adam Langley, uh, postdoc Josh Ka Kaplan, Blanca Bernal, uh, Melissa McCormick, Justin Mester is a grad student, and the 2014 Bryn Martians, who are my students. They came up with the name. I'm at Bryn Mawr College, so it's the Bryn Martians. I thought it's kind of cute. So getting into this talk, so sort of going in completely different directions. We've heard a lot about different global change stressors today. Um, we heard several, t you know, we're focusing on nitrogen. We've had a lot of great talks about nitrogen. And, you know, just starting off, Jim Galloway proposed that, you know, we've doubled the amount of reactive nitrogen in our global nitrogen cycle. As a consequence of this, we've seen lots of potential negative effects. So we've heard, Kathy just introduced the work by Linda Deegan et al., the Tide Project, where I'm working right now, where we have creek bank destabilization and the marshes are literally crumbling apart. At the same time, in Chesapeake Bay marshes, we see when we add nutrients, we can have complete species shifts because certain plant species respond to nitrogen. Those tend to be the C4 grasses, whereas C3 sedges don't necessarily respond to nitrogen. So then we can have a change in plant communities. And if you're switching to a plant community that isn't as responsive to sea level rise, we can actually have negative consequences as well. Or we can also favor invasive species, which I'll talk about in a moment. At the same time, we know CO2 concentrations are rising. So we've gone from pre-industrial concentrations from around 280 parts per million, and we've surpassed 400 parts per million for the first time in human history. So you know, it's a milestone. I mean, the last time CO2 concentrations were this high, it was around 4 million years ago. Global temperatures were about 4 degrees warmer, and sea levels were, I think, 10 meters higher. Don't quote me on that. I forgot the number off the top of my head. But why this is important is because, again, we have a different, in these tidal systems, we have C3 species, we have C4 species. So what we find is that the C3 species respond positively to CO, elevated CO2 by increasing their photosynthetic rates. So those are the forbs, the sedges, and so, certain grasses like Phragmites australis, whereas the C4 plants don't necessarily respond. So now we're sort of at this conundrum. So we have sort of trade-offs. Certain species respond to one global change factors. Other ones respond to another one. And then just to make things really complicated and interesting, we also have invasive species. So when they come in, they can completely change the structure of the ecosystem. As a result, they're changing the function. And now this is going to alter ecosystem services. So the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, the invasive species I'll be talking about. So who here is familiar with Phragmites australis? Who isn't? Come on, there's got to be someone here. So, you know, we, we know it's, it's a problematic plant. It's the world's most widely distributed flowering plant. It's found on every continent except for Antarctica. And what's unique about it is, I'm going to tell you a story, how it's responding to multiple factors at the same time. Um, it is a C3 plant, so it has the potential to respond to CO2. And we, a lot of research says it responds to nitrogen as well. So you may be familiar with it. I love this picture. You're going into New Jersey. It's just sitting there waiting for you in the roadside ditches. The New Jersey Meadowlands outside my hotel window. Window. It's just there. I mean, it's everywhere. It's job security for me. I mean, I figure um, it's everywhere. And for people who aren't aware, what we're dealing with is an invasive lineage. So we have native Phragmites here. But what happened is, is when people were coming over from Europe, they were, you know, they were dropping their ballast. They came into port. And what I'm showing you here is a picture. I always like putting natural history with talks is um, this is an herbarium picture taken from the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. This is one of the samples that Kristen Saltonstall sampled. And this is the, if we look at the label, I wish it was a better picture. It says the locality. This is the ballast grounds of Camden, New Jersey in September of 1876. And this plant has been genetically identified as haplotype M or the introduced lineage. So what's really cool is this is the first genetically identified species and I'm right there in Bryn Mawr College. So I'm working in the epicenter of Phragmites invasion to the best of our knowledge. So it's, it's kind of a fun place to work. But the question really is, is when we're replacing these communities from these short grass communities, these Spartina dominated marshes to this really tall stature community, you know what's gonna happen? So the, what I wanna talk about now for the remaining time is to really talk about how do multiple interacting global change factors, CO2, nitrogen, and relative sea level rise affect Phragmites invasion? Also, how do these global change factors affect resilience? How do they affect Resilience, and I'll finish off with ecosystem carbon gain. So the research I've been conducting has been done at the Smithsonian Global Change Research Wetland. So it's part of the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. So we're out there in Chesapeake Bay. 
So this is home to the world's longest running elevated CO2 experiment started by Bert Drake in 1986, and that's mainly looking at how do the native plant communities respond. So there are sedges and grasses. There's also a CO2 by nitrogen experiment. I talked about some of the results already. So they're looking at how does how do the global change factors interact with nitrogen. I'll be talking briefly about uh, CO2 by nitrogen by relative sea level rise experiments of marsh organ experiment, as well as a CO2 by nitrogen invasive, sp invasive species experiment. So it's a really cool place to work. I invite anyone to come down and visit. And it's really pleasant to work with because there's boardwalks everywhere. So it's really great to, to do research in contrast to some of my other field sites. So Kathy, um, a moment ago, introduced the Marsh Organ Experiment. And what I want to talk about are some of the key findings. So what we did is we just can't do things simple at CERC. What we like to do is make things really complicated and interactive. So we did a Marsh Organ Experiment. but So this is what the plants look like. But what we did is we had two plant communities, uh, two levels of CO2 ambient and the year 2100, two levels of nitrogen ambient and 25 grams of nitrogen per meter squared per year. We, had, we were in Chesapeake Bay microtidal tidal range around 44 centimeters and we looked at how does plant growth change as a function of co2 nitrogen and relative sea level rise but i'm not going to talk that much about that what i really wanted to focus on is what's happening below ground because we know below ground is really driving carbon sequestration as well as surface elevation gain so the coolest result I found from this experiment, which sort of spear, you know, sort of jumped me into a whole new line of research, is looking at what happens with below ground with elevated CO2. So here we have, um, this is elevation to mean high, high water, and this is below ground biomass, and this is only with Phragmites. So what we found is, is that when you added elevated CO2, we had a profound shift in roots deeper. So the plants shifted their roots deeper, uh, that was with CO2. So the color coding, just to be consistent from now on, the white is going to be control, green is nitrogen, orange is CO2, and blue is CO2 plus nitrogen. So we see a CO2 or CO2 plus nitrogen really profoundly deepens the rooting zone. And that's really important because if you're putting your roots deeper, they're going to probably stay there longer. They're going to not decompose as quickly. And we see nitrogen increases root productivity. So we're in organic soil. So we're seeing some increases with nitrogen. But if we compare that to the native plant community, so this is a slightly different color scheme. So this is depth below soil surface, and this is the cumulative proportion of below ground biomass. The circles is Phragmites. Uh, white is CO2. This is under ambient conditions. And this is the native plant community. What we're finding is it's consistent that CO2 increases rooting depth with Phragmites. But what's really important is that Phragmites is rooting significantly deeper than the native plant community. So the native plants usually have over 90% of their biomass in the, so this is cumulative proportion in the top 30 centimeters. Well, at the top 30 centimeters, Phragmites only has around 60% of its biomass. So that got us thinking, OK, it's rooting deeper. This is a mesocosm experiment. How does this really happen in the field? So a graduate student, Justin Mester, what he did is he went out on cord marshes. And what we found is that Phragmites is indeed rooting deeper in other sites as well. And what we're finding is that this is a soil depth that's down to 3 and a half meters. And then this is the cumulative root fraction. So how much percent of the roots are below ground? Again, we're seeing the native plant community, more than 95% is in the top 30 centimeters, whereas Phragmites is rooting down to over three meters deep. And we don't hit, you know, if we look at where's the majority of his roots, so 90% of the roots, we're down at almost two meters. And I will say, I'm not going to present some of these results. Justin's defending his thesis next week. But we're finding that these roots are active. And these plants are taking up nitrogen at depths of 80 centimeters. So it's really cool. So this is, so the question I have here is, are we missing carbon pools in our estimates? If we're only sampling the top 30 centimeters, even the top meter, we may be missing a lot of carbon that needs to be accounted for. And this is also really important with respect to the ability of these plants or these wetland ecosystems to keep pace with sea level rise. We know that. Soil elevation gain is directly linked to root productivity. So if we're having more below ground productivity, we have this greater potential to keep pace with sea level rise. And I'll be coming back to that in a few moments. So with that, I'm sort of going to build a cumulative summary. So, so far, I'm going to say that CO2 increases rooting depth and that this is going to feed back on below ground processes and potentially carbon storage. So now I want to jump into another experiment, which is the big, uh, my bigger experiment I started back in 2010, is to really understand how will these interacting global change factors affect invasion, ecosystem resilience, and carbon gain. So this is an open top chamber design. So we have 12 chambers. We have two levels of CO2. So we have ambience and plus 340. So we're simulating the year 2100. 
We have two levels of nitrogen in our ambient, and then we add uh, another nitrogen, similar nitrogen loading rate, which is 25 grams of nitrogen per meter squared per year, which is a relatively conservative estimate for Chesapeake Bay. And what we're looking at is how does this wall of Phragmites invade into the natural ecosystem? So when we started this experiment, what we did is we sort of plopped them over the invasion edge. So each chamber only had around 18 to 20 stems of Phragmites. So we normalized everything from the beginning. And then what we're looking at is, you know, looking from the front of the chamber at the beginning of the experiment, is to look at how does Phragmites invasion change as a factor of these global change factors into this high marsh community. So we're looking, you know, we have our C4 grass meadows, Spartina patens and Sticklus, we have the C3 sedges, we have C3 forbs, and uh, we have some shrubs. So our species richness is very high. It's, it's a 11, which is pretty diverse for tidal marshes, and it makes for a really interesting story. In addition, we also have a modified surface elevation table. It's the, so the other experiment has the monster arm, we're calling this the mega arm. It's over three meters long. And what's really cool is we can look at how does surface elevation change in the native marsh reference area within the experimental chamber and within the Phragmites marsh area. So um, in the Phragmites reference area. So we have some really good elevation data. So every year, thankfully, we count every single plant. So I'd like to thank all the volunteers and students and everybody who's going there to collect this really robust data set. So we actually count every single Phragmites plant. We genetically identify it. Now, that's a story I'm not going to be talking about today. Um, we count all the sedges, and we do a, cup, um, a subset on the grasses. So we actually know where every single species is. We do it in 25 centimeter quadrats. So we have a really robust data set. And what I'd like to present to you is this is ecosystem biomass at peak. So this is um, peak productivity biomass in grams per meter squared um, over time. So just this is 2011, 2012, 2013. Red is Phragmites, green is grasses, orange are sedges. So grasses are C4, sedges and shrubs are C3, and we also have some forbs. So one thing I'd like to point out is that we've had a rapid change in plant community composition with either treatment. So when we add CO2, um, we can see that Phragmites is starting to um, invade really quickly. We add nitrogen, we're seeing a similar effect. Now, what we're seeing as well is that we're not having a CO2 effect yet at the ecosystem level. So that's when we scale everything up to what's happening. We're not seeing that effect. And that's not surprising, because if you look at this, when these systems started out, they were primarily grasses. And these grasses don't respond to CO2. You know, our CO2 effect is relatively weak. But I predict that as Phragmites overtakes those chambers, we're going to start to really visualize that CO2 effect. However, what we're seeing is a really strong effect of nitrogen. So nitrogen increases ecosystem productivity. You can see under the nitrogen and the CO2 plus nitrogen treatment, consistently we're increasing ecosystem productivity. And we see uh, certain years are more productive than others, as we see by the nitrogen by CO2 interaction. But what I'd like to really focus on is what's happening with the Phragmites. So uh, here we have Phragmites density. So that's ramets per square meter, uh, normalized this per square meter in the chamber. And what we're seeing is, is that this changes in global change factors is what's driving the invasion. So um, if we look at our control treatments are stable. So we put on these chambers in 2010, and the, our control treatments have not changed density significantly since we started the experiment. We have a significant CO2 increases plant density. Nitrogen increases plant density. We have an interaction with CO2 plus nitrogen. So what, what this is really showing is that when we add any global change factor, whether it's nitrogen or it's as CO2 concentrations increase, what this is suggesting is that we're really going to start accelerating Phragmites australis invasion. So, all right, time-wise, I'm okay. So then what we did, so you know, just sort of summarizing what we know, is that CO2 and nitrogen are rapidly increasing Phragmites invasion rates, and this is going to be changing the community composition of these tidal wetlands. But then what's going on below ground? We know that Phragmites has this immense below ground carbon stock. And I'd like to thank Bob Meadows for this picture. I believe this is from um, Delaware Bay. So what we also did is we collect data on below ground productivity. So we have root and growth bags. And the way that chamber was set up, we have some on the Phragmites end, some on the native ch chamber end. Now that's getting kind of muddied. It was a really great design when I started, but I forgot that Phragmites is going to be overtaking the native end. So it's making the interpretation is a little bit interesting. But what I'd like to point out here is this is Phragmites root productivity on the left. The panel on the right is native, the native side root productivity. And what we're seeing here is that, first of all, Phragmites community has a significantly, significantly greater root productivity, and that 
CO2 productivity is increased with both CO2 and nitrogen on the Phragmites side, and the effects of CO2 and nitrogen are additive. Whereas if we look on the native side over here, first of all, I'd like to point out is that nitrogen is actually decreasing productivity. And that's something that we've seen in similar systems. We've seen that in the Tide project. So the native plants aren't necessarily responding to nitrogen that's also been supported by that study. But then the CO2 by nitrogen peak, what we're seeing here, is really being driven by Phragmites invading into that side over time. Um, if we look at surface elevation gain, so this is just cumulative elevation change since the beginning of the experiment. Um, so this is normalized to millimeters of, of accumulation of elevation per year. We're seeing that Phragmites supports a higher rate of surface elevation than the native plant than the native side of the chamber, and that these effects here are actually attributed here on the native side are actually just the Phragmites overrunning the native side of the chamber. So we're seeing that Phragmites, due to this increase below ground productivity, is gaining more surface elevation. So I'd like to get down, so we, if we think about ecosystem resilience, if these systems can build more soil and can build more surface elevation, so this is gonna suggest that in a rapidly changing environment, Phragmites invaded wetlands may actually be more resilient to relative sea level rise, nitrogen pollution, and uh, rising CO2 con concentrations when compared to other you know, native plant communities with respect to their ability to build soils, to increase carbon stocks and, you know, as I said, keep pace with sea level rise. So then I'd like to finish off with, you know, going to carbon. So Jim Tang and several have talked about carbon sequestration in these systems. And we know that, you know, so what, what we did here is we built a model to estimate GPP. So I haven't looked at methane efflux inside these chambers. We know that the plants are respiring, the roots are respiring. Uh, that's going to the balance between GPP and respiration is going to dictate our, our rates of accretion. We also have lateral transport. But what we did with my postdoc is we actually estimated um, GPP. And to do that, what we did is I've been out there every year collecting light response curves. So you know we measured rates of photosynthesis to see how do they change as a function of light within all the different chambers. So we have empirical data looking at the instantaneous response of these plants, of various plants within these chambers to light. And then what we did is, I'm going to give a, a word version of the model. I'm not going to put the big equation up on the board. It's going to be really scary. But essentially, we took empirical data on photosynthetic rates, growth rates of the plants, vertical growth rates, uh, leaf structure, canopy structure. And then we add daily interview, in intervals, group plants in height, and added leaves. So we actually simulated the plants growing. We also looked at how does photosynthesis change in 10 centimeter light intervals. And then we, then you know, we corrected for temperature. And we looked at net carbon simulation in each canopy layer, and we looked at carbon gains or losses to actually get to our estimates of GPP. So what I'd like to point out here is this is oh, these are the model simulation. This is the average of ten model runs. So this is carbon carbon simulation over a day of year, and this is a PPFD. So we can see there's a nice relationship between PPFD and carbon gain. I'd like to point out is that when we add nitrogen, interestingly, we see is we see a phenological shift, that we see increased productivity in the early and the late part of the growing season. When we add CO2, we sort of see this peak here later in the growing season. And that CO2 plus nitrogen is a combination of those two. And you can see here's the cumulative change in carbon sequestration, or a GPP, relative to our control treatment. And to sort of bring this all together, you know, we've modeled how does, plant, how does GPP change as a function of plant density? I'm going to focus on 100 stems per square meter because that's sort of monocultures of Phragmites. That's sort of the typical estimate. And if we look at that, no, nope, I'm supposed to have a little thing. So if we're just looking at this 100 stems per, 100 stems per meter square, what well, we're seeing the effects of stimulation of CO2 is around 49%, 62% with nitrogen and over 116% when we combine the effects of CO2 plus nitrogen. So that's a really big effect of carbon gain. And if we want to validate this data with field data, so then we took the data from the chambers. Uh, this is from the 2013 year, so this data is corrected for the productivity we measured inside the chambers. And if we scale that productivity up to that 100 stems per square meter, we have, uh, we have our model prediction. This is our census data. And then this, the, the red is the native plants. That's what, what's happening in the CO2 by nitrogen experiment without Phragmites. So that's comparing how do Phragmites invaded wetlands compare with native plant communities. And here what we're seeing is that First, you know, I'd just like to say we have really good agreement of the model, not so much with CO2, but that's because a lot of that's going below ground. But what we're seeing here is compared to the native plant community, about a 44% stimulation 
of um, GPP relative, or so this is actually GPP, this is kilograms of carbon, by the way, per meter squared per year relative to native community. 74% more CO2, 136% more with uh, nitrogen, and 157% more with CO2 plus nitrogen. And this model is relatively robust. It fills within, so there's only a couple other studies that looked at GPP. Uh, they did eddy covariance tower in uh, China, as well as one in a freshwater wetland in Ohio. So we're, you know, our model is, you know, the outputs seem to be very valid. The, they're reasonable, so I'm very confident in this data. So what this comes together to suggest is that Phragmites GPP under, in the future is over two times that of the native plant community if we're going under the business as usual scenarios of elevated CO2 and nitrogen. And that sort of changes things because now we can think not as Phragmites potentially as a nuisance but as this tremendous carbon sink. So that sort of brings us to these management Im implications and I'm, I still have things saying that time's up. So given the strong invasion response to nitrogen, so if we want to limit Phragmites, we may want to limit nitrogen from hitting our coastal ecosystems. So if we can reduce nitrogen loading, we'll, we'll limit Phragmites. The data is really, very robust. However, decreasing nitrogen loading is also going to reduce ecosystem production, possibly limiting rates of soil accretion and decre decreasing the resilience to relative sea level rise. Now, if Phragmites is so good at fixing carbon, should we be eradicating Phragmites from coastal wetlands? Because Phragmites dominated wetlands may be more resilient in a rapidly changing environment. And I'd like to put this out, we heard a lot about herbicides, and 4.6 million US dollars a year are used in the United States alone uh, uh, to control Phragmites. So then, you know, there's some really big unanswered questions here. You know, how does this mediation affect carbon storage? They come through, they eradicate everything, Often when they kill Phragmites, there's no plan on replanting or anything. So now we have these systems that are just net heterotrophic, respiring away lots of carbon. It takes years to decades for something to come back, and often it's just Phragmites. So then, you know, the sort of the question I'm going to leave us with is, do we value wetlands that can keep pace with relative sea level rise and fix carbon, or are we going to become fixated, or is management become fixated on species and habitat type? So. With that, I'd like to thank the multiple funding sources and a lot of other people that helped out. So, thank you.